So hello, everybody. So I'm very happy to be talking virtually here in the Bay Area. And since I'm here virtually in the Bay Area, I thought I might include a virtual Bay Area background. So that's the Golden Gate Bridge. OK, so um, what I'd like to talk about is a question which really has bugged me for a lot of my career within checkpointing. So why can't I checkpoint this? Why can't I checkpoint that? What are the limits of checkpointing? Are there any real limits? So as we'll see, one of the big questions is, well, can you checkpoint the hardware using software only techniques? But we'll go deeper into that. Let's right now get the talk started. Okay. So um, and before I forget, I'd also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this keynote. So this talk is organized into three parts. Uh, the first two parts will be a little shorter, and then I want to emphasize the third part. So first, I'll give you a somewhat personal view of the world from uh, the viewpoint of DMTCP. In there, we will talk about both transparent checkpointing and even some brief highlights of application specific checkpointing. But I'll say right now that my own work has been mostly in the area of transparent checkpointing. So transparent of course means that the application does not have to be modified to work with the checkpointing, uh, the checkpointing uh, package. Uh, nevertheless, as we'll see, sometimes you may need some very small compromises. There isn't a sharp line where application specific starts up. Sometimes there's a gray area. But in the case from there, we'll get on to what are the real challenges behind checkpointing the hardware? So for me, that's the real question going forward. And of course, this is about supercomputing. And in supercomputing, one of the things that we see is that the hardware does change. The type of network interconnect that you're using changes. The number of cores changes. There's potential for on-chip networking of the cores. Of course, we're talking now about accelerators. Uh, CUDA is a famous example, but there are other accelerators on the horizon. So if we're really going to be successful in transparent checkpointing, in supercomputing, then we absolutely must be prepared to at least simulate checkpointing the hardware. If we can simulate it so that it looks like we checkpointed the hardware, maybe that's good enough. And then in the third part, I'll talk about, well, what are the challenges to doing this? And are those challenges necessarily a showstopper? I don't believe they are. And so what I'm going to emphasize, you'll see when we get there, is it's a matter of boundaries and plumbing. Where should you set the boundary when you want to checkpoint hardware? Turns out, I think you should not be setting the boundary right at the hardware itself and trying to emulate calls to the hardware. There are other ways to do that. But before we go there, let's first give a rough view of uh, of checkpointing as it existed in supercomputing. Uh, as always, uh, you know, well, there was a popular map that started at one point, a New Yorker's view of the United States in which you would see Fifth Avenue. By the time you get to the West Side, it's getting a little smaller. There's that rather small George Washington Bridge and California is really tiny and it's really hard to make, up, make out the Bay Area anyway. So this is going to be the DMTCP view of the world. But nevertheless, hopefully I'm not too inaccurate. Okay, let's start. So I've been leading this project in DMTCP for about 15 years. We now even finally uh, decided to have our own logo. Uh, here are some uh, organizations that currently support us. And of course, uh, there have been others that have supported us in the past but this is a reasonable snapshot of where we are today. So let's start with transparent checkpointing, and then I'll say a few words also about application specific. Uh, 
uh, it's important to be aware of it. To the extent that application specific is not an excessive burden, it can even play a role. And there's a possibility even for a hybrid checkpointing scheme. But first, if we go back to the old days, here I say checkpointing.org started, stopped before 2010, maybe around 2005. Let's take a look at that, just to look at the prehistory, the stone age of checkpointing. So here was a picture of checkpointing as it existed before 2005, even in many cases before 2000. There are about 19 projects. We specifically submitted our name eventually here. And in any case, we have now uh, some early efforts on your own time, encourage you to look at it. Uh, these are all pretty much transparent checkpointing. Um, so, and what's interesting here is almost none of the ones here are still around. Pretty much none of them, except Condor, really famous, uh, and then hopefully our own DMTCP itself. So what's going on that all these other checkpointing packages arose and then somehow they disappeared? In particular, if we look through it, sometimes we can see some aspirations. So uh, here we see the latest release in Linux 2.4.2, the uh, Linux 2.4 source available. And for some of these, uh, you would read that they are currently uh, asking for a review to be added into the kernel. Um, here we see a kernel level checkpointing system for MPI itself. So moving back, oh, and probably you didn't see most of that because when I click, I forgot to, to change the stop sharing to share the other screen. Uh, but hopefully you can do that on your own time. Uh, but orally, you heard me talk about the different projects and uh, you can find it just by clicking here on your screen. Okay, next uh, we can talk about uh, BLCR. BLCR is really famous in high performance computing and certainly supercomputing also. Uh, it has, here I'm listing these uh, by date roughly according to the year in which they were published. Obviously each of these had their own history even before they were published. But BLCR is a module inside the kernel uh, for Linux. As a module inside the kernel, it definitely seemed like the way to go at that time, because after all, then you have direct access to the process table. And when you restart, you can, you can solve this age old question, what do you do about the process ID? If you control the process table, you just find the process slot, which has that same process ID, and you restart your process and force it into that slot of the process table. So there you go. You don't need other tricks like virtual virtualization of process IDs and so on. Uh, and this is good. Uh, ultimately, when I had some conversations with the co-authors uh, many years later, perhaps about 10 years later, um, what they told me is that uh, it was popular for many years, but then at some point, many MPI implementations were starting to use shared memory, specifically System 5 shared memory. System 5 shared memory uh, because now we were seeing CPUs with many cores. When there are many cores, we do not want to use some kind of network communication between MPI ranks. We want to support one MPI rank per core using shared memory for efficient computation. If we're going to support that system five shared memory between MPI ranks, then BLCR would have to handle that too. BLCR can checkpoint a tree of processes, but it, they, it would have been a large effort to go back and also move over to the system five portion of the kernel and even perhaps add some user space component in order to properly support that. So at that point, things started uh, moving, opening up for us in DMTCP. We had been moving in from the low end of checkpointing. Um, 
But let's continue with the BLCR story first. So BLCR was incorporated in a number of famous MPI app, uh, packages. Uh, in particular, there is MVAPage. Uh, this is the uh, team of DK Panda uh, with uh, Gao leading this effort in 2006. <clears throat> the issue there was um, that InfiniBand was becoming popular. And if InfiniBand is becoming popular, then at that point, we needed to do something different. So the idea was, well, let's stop the InfiniBand then let's checkpoint each process using BLCR. BLCR itself was only able to checkpoint independent processes for the most part. It could maintain a parent-child relationship, but other than that, it was just checkpointing independent processes. Um, I'll move slightly ahead to the year 2009. There in OpenMPI, they had a similar idea. Let's stop the InfiniBand network and then call on BLCR, here again, BLCR, in order to checkpoint the individual MPI processes, the MPI ranks. So this is great. Uh, they had even one better idea. Suppose you would be able to checkpoint, say, under TCP IP and restart under InfiniBand. So you can stop the InfiniBand interconnect uh, in your MPI package, and then you can restart under the TCP IP interconnect. Well, in our case, we were coming from a different philosophy. In DMTCP, we did not want to modify the kernel at all. We wanted to work entirely in user space, and for the most part, also without any user privileges. This is important if we're going to start at the low end, and that's why the desktop appears, desktop meaning desktop and cluster communications, com computations, no special privileges. So what you'll see is eventually we came around full circle about 10 years later, and we were able to recapture this early result in OpenMPI where we could checkpoint under InfiniBand, restart under TCP IP, and we could do even one better because we could fully coexist with system five shared memory. Uh, again, I'll remind you, BLCR was not compatible with system five shared memory. I say is not compatible, but the updates to BLCR are less frequent than in the past. Okay, so now let's look at application specific checkpointing, which has surely played a very large role in supercomputing. So, Again, this is a somewhat arbitrary selection, but hopefully uh, people agree that I hit a lot of the highlights. Uh, as I say, my own area wasn't specifically application specific. But in 2003, there's a publication describing the Sierra framework. So think of that as an early kind of MATLAB for supercomputing. And so in this case, their idea was not to exactly have a save workspace and re uh, and restore a workspace feature. But nevertheless, if you your application can say when you want to save a, an image of the important part of your memory, an important part that will be sufficient so that you can restart the application. And they had a numerous uh, canned strategies, canned code here, where you could just feed in your configurations, your input, your uh, geometry, and so on. Uh, and then you're off to the races. The uh, checkpointing portion came a little later. And when I had discussions at Los Alamos about this, it was interesting some of the anecdotes that I was hearing. One particular one impressed me. Sorry, I should have said Sandia. When I was at Sandia discussing this, one of the anecdotes that impressed me uh, was that uh, what happens is there was an interesting kind of bit decay in the checkpointing package. The problem is that the checkpointing module is independent of the application modules. So eventually somebody decides to add some new features to the application module. At that point, you have to update the checkpointing module to save the important state. 
Well, maybe the guy who wrote the checkpointing module has left or moved on to a different project. There's no reason to have somebody full-time year in, year out supporting the checkpointing module. To write the code initially maybe was full-time, but in less than a year, you have that running. So the problem is there wasn't enough institutional knowledge of how the checkpointing module interfaces with the other applications. And that seems to have been a kind of Achilles heel where the modules specified what was the important state and kept to that, things work well. Where they, they diverged from some spec about what was the important state, there were problems. So this comes back to this theme that I want to emphasize about boundaries. To the extent that they're able to set important boundaries and say all of the important state is on this side of the boundary, the scheme works very well. But that's really the issue. OK, uh, at a similar time, there was the work of uh, Bronovetsky and others on a, a library for application level checkpointing. Here, the idea was, let's make this library as non-invasive as possible. Again, so we don't want to burden the end user too much. So if the user can simply declare perhaps what are the important data structures in their code, but in this case, the hope was to go one step better. If we could actually have a compiler that would have a pre-compile phase, which would identify what is the important state, and then the compiler could insert into your code something to save that important state. And then you need an absolute minimum of end user code in your application, maybe to catch things that the compiler didn't catch, or maybe simply to say, when is the right time to checkpoint? So again, a really nice uh, piece of work. And there was, a, there was a stream of work beyond that, including several interesting publications. OK, uh, then uh, as we move on, uh, another one that I should point out is uh, Flex.io. Um, so Flex.io, IO middleware. So this is many of the co-authors were coming out of Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, and uh, here we see that there's actually a team of 12 co-authors. Uh, it was really a large work and important work. And the idea is if you use purely transparent checkpointing, then there will be IO bottlenecks <clears throat> and you need some middleware to mediate these IO bottlenecks. Otherwise, transparent checkpointing is liable to do just the obvious thing. Let's write this file and stop, the next file, stop, next file, stop. And there can be a lot of overhead. For an interesting talk in this conference related to that, I, uh, uh, I, I encourage you to look at the talk of Jane and Wang on spades, S-P-A-D-E-S. So there's an application where they hit up on exactly this issue in trying to apply transparent checkpointing DMTCP. And so it works somewhat, but they also have recommendations to include some help on the application specific side for more efficient IO. Okay, so um, then uh, continuing into some of the highlights, some uh, work which I've really appreciated now uh, ever since I heard a talk on it by Capello. Uh, fast error bound lossy HPC data compression with SC. So instead of transparently checkpointing all of your data, if it's something like a partial differential equation, the data is related. And therefore, there is some kind of smooth change, smooth change in space, and even smooth change in time. If there's a smooth change, surely we should be able to get good compression. And if we can get good compression, then on restart, Let's allow our application algorithm to continue to work. And if on restart, there are some accidental bumps that were inserted when we try to do the smooth compression, well, the algorithm is going to smooth out those bumps anyway. Many algorithms will continue from an initial state, which is not perfect, and they'll make the initial state better and better. So it's an important idea. 
Uh, otherwise, we should also talk about things like uh, SCR and ULFM, and perhaps a nice paper to highlight that work is CRAFT, a library for easier application level checkpointing. Here, the idea is you can have multiple levels and you don't have to immediately checkpoint everything and restart everything. Sometimes you can fix one piece of your computation that went wrong and then continue. And Veloci is another project which, um, in which they want to be able to adapt, for example, to work with SCR. And in Veloci, they want to make it very easy to provide a library so that the user can declare what is their important state for application level checkpointing. Good, now let's move on to the second part of the talk. Hopefully this is give you, you a view, I hope a reasonably honest view of where checkpointing is, but nevertheless, I have this slightly facetious title. A New York view of the United States, a DMTC per peers view of the world, the world of checkpointing. But now, so why, why is it that we're facing this problem now? We need to checkpoint the hardware and hardware normally doesn't want to be checkpointed especially if we're gonna use software to get inside the hard hardware. That's kind of a non-starter. Well, again, let's continue with an, a personal view. So in the very early days when we were doing our uh, DMTCP work, uh, we had this idea, well, okay, we can checkpoint a process on a single computer. And then at this point, uh, we're done. Why would we ever wanna checkpoint the network? If you checkpoint the network, then from the network, the application can call out to absolutely anything. It can go to the web and decide to uh, start playing a game on the web. How are we gonna checkpoint that game on the web that called out to? So we had this great slogan. The slogan was, you can't checkpoint the world. Well, we don't use that slogan too much anymore. Now our slogan is more like, what do we do to checkpoint the hardware? So we've moved beyond those days, but let's follow this a uh, nostalgic trip in time. So at some point we decided, okay, well, we can checkpoint the network. If it's TCP IP, it's probably easy enough because with TCP IP, they have this nice thing that messages are sent and then delivered in order. So as long as they're delivered in order, it's great. We had this uh, trick, which in hindsight maybe seems a, a little obvious but, uh, and probably others had thought of similar ideas. But if we want to checkpoint and there's a network, yes, we can't checkpoint the switches in the middle of the network. All we have to do is remove the data from those switches in the network, and then we can checkpoint. And so how do we do that? Well, we stop the user processes. And once the user processes are stopped, on the sender side of a socket, we send a cookie. On the receiver side, we keep receiving, we call it draining the network until we see that cookie. Now there's no more data in the network. Now we can checkpoint, now we can restart. Um, and what you'll see is this is in fact a variant of uh, some techniques that other people had tried even earlier. Uh, the general theme is drain whatever is outside of your region of checkpointing. Now checkpoint it and now whatever you drained, put it back again. We saw this, for example, in the strategies with MPI and BLCR. The early ideas for checkpointing MPR was drain whatever is in the network and, or, and disconnect the network and restart. So this is an early version of that only for TCP IP. Well, but then of course, uh, especially in supercomputing, they said, no, you need to use InfiniBand. TCP IP is not going to cut it. Okay, so a student uh, did some very nice work over maybe about a year, and uh, he had a very nice publication. Uh, he got a thesis out of that and some other work. Uh, and so at that point we said, okay, we can checkpoint InfiniBand. Now we're done, you can't checkpoint the world. Well, then of course, the next thing is we saw these GPU accelerators coming up in supercomputing. And we're starting to get nervous. Checkpointing InfiniBand was not going to be enough when you have the GPU accelerators. Okay, so let's see, you have to promise now, you have to promise that we're going to be able to checkpoint the process, the network interconnect, oh yeah, and any coprocessors in case there are others besides GPU. 
But anyway, that's it. We're done now. There's nothing more to do, right? Well, you can see why we were starting to get nervous. So at some point we're gonna say, you know, maybe we have to think more clearly about the hardware. So, so far the history has been one of meeting the needs in, in our case of, of DMTCP as we scale up, but also in supercomputing, supercomputing more CPU cores, then bigger and better network interconnects. Uh, now we have the compute accelerators. So we really need not just a new thesis every two or three years that shows how to checkpoint the latest compute accelerator. If we do that, that's dangerous because then we end up supporting more and more of these different compute interfaces and something is going to break eventually. So at this point, uh, let's look at what are some tricks for getting away with doing a new thesis every two or three years to show how to checkpoint the latest technique in supercomputing. Well, first I'm gonna talk about the VNC trick. We'll talk about that soon. Um, then we'll talk about how to checkpoint CUDA for GPUs. So the, this is along the line of hardware. And then ultimately, if we're gonna think into the future, well, what about tensor processing units? People say that's good for deep learning. Maybe AI chips also good for deep learning. What about FPGAs? Very flexible. And we don't really talk so much about checkpointing big data, but shouldn't we at least be thinking about it? And you know, in the future, as scalability gets better and better, we may have future networks on a chip. We may have chips layered on top of each other, literally uh, chips soldered, soldered onto each other. Um, we can see that now with uh, TEMSET, for example, burst buffers on top of a chip. So we really have to be thinking about hardware and how are we going to support hardware itself? So at this point, sorry, I'm looking at the time and I read the time upside down. That's not helpful. Okay, so uh, why can't I also checkpoint the hardware? Well, at one point, uh, one thing that got us involved was the Cray GNI network interconnect. At first, uh, at uh, at NERSC, uh, uh, Rebecca Hartman Baker had reached out to us and said that BLCR is no longer working well for them. Uh, would we be interested in a project to checkpoint at uh, at NERSC? But the problem there is they were using the Cray GNI, and initially we said no. It's a long story, but eventually came back to it, uh, and you'll see why. Um, another case of hardware, how about OpenGL on GPUs? Well, we had an early effort about seven years ago to checkpoint OpenGL on GPUs, and ultimately it seemed like it was going to be a large effort. Maybe a student could get a thesis out of it in the end, but it wasn't clear how we're going to maintain it anyway, especially because OpenGL kept adding new features and new versions. Uh, and so then of course, there's the issue of combining application specific and transparent checkpointing. And for that, you might want to look at the talk on Veloce uh, in, this, uh, in, in this symposium by Bogdan et al. So this brings us now to the third part. Hopefully I've motivated why checkpointing the hardware is such an important question here in supercomputing. So as I say, if we can set the right boundaries, maybe there's still a hope for doing it. Let's see what I mean by those boundaries. So uh, I hypothesize that the central challenge for the future of checkpointing, this is my thesis, thesis statement, of course, not a thesis, uh, checkpointing the hardware is difficult. In the past, solution one was popular. And now we want to move on to solution two. Of course, this is a good topic for conversation. It's a shame that this is virtual. This would be a really fun thing to talk about in the hallways if we were all meeting personally. Um, and perhaps in the 
there may be time for that, uh, perhaps in a break, we'll see. Any case, solution number one, the idea is checkpointing is difficult, especially when it's about hardware. So let's disconnect from the hardware. Disconnect, checkpoint what's left over, and then reconnect. We saw examples of that. That's the way MPI was using BLCR. Uh, that's the origin of the VNC trick that I'll display shortly. But then solution two is the one that we're now favoring. We've, we also were doing something like this. For example, when we checkpointed TCP IP, we don't wanna do that anymore. We wanna stay connected. Uh, so uh, if we're going to stay connected, we're not going to disconnect, then maybe we can make do with a separate proxy process address space or whatever. And so the idea now is if we can isolate the portion that we have such difficulty checkpointing and then just checkpoint the rest, maybe now life will be easier. So that's about setting a boundary. Initially, if you put the, the other stuff inside a different process, that's a really strong boundary, a different process. But it turns out that has some overhead. Now we're tending more toward, can you keep it in a different address space, but within the same process? And you'll see what I mean by that also later. Um, and if you want to see some of the history, I encourage you to look up in the thesis of a former student of mine, Kapil Arye, where he's talking about exactly this uh, under this name, process virtualization, specifically section 1.3. But VNC, here's the VNC trick. And the VNC trick is so old that again, it must come from the stone age of computing. Uh, I have no idea who did it first. Uh, so the joke is whoever uh, invented VNC, somebody came along and said, oh, that's interesting. Can I use that for checkpointing? So let's do a quick review. In VNC, you have a VNC server that has the application. You have a VNC viewer. And then the VNC viewer talks to a GPU along with any drivers in the kernel and then displays. Okay, very good. So you start the X application in your VNC server. You connect it with a VNC viewer and you can see everything you're doing. At that point, when you want a checkpoint, you kill the VNC viewer. You now have this picture here. We have the X application, so far so good. There is no VNC viewer. And so there's no connection here. How did they do this? They did this because they had modified the, or they had added code into VNC itself so that VNC knows how to disconnect and then reconnect to a VNC viewer later. This is exactly the same history that we saw with MPI. MPI knew how to disconnect from InfiniBand, then call on BLCR for checkpointing, and then MPI would reconnect to InfiniBand. And each dialect of MCI had to struggle through that same code again and again, even to the extent that in the case of OpenMPI, they now have a place on their webpage where they say that checkpointing is no longer supported at OpenMPI, but we are interested in somebody who would like to bring that code back to life because they have to maintain that code. Luckily in VNC, it's been easy to maintain that code because you have a stable interface because X Windows has not changed. And this is based on X Windows. Since X Windows is stable standard, VNC is stable. And so this trick continues to work even now, 20, 30 years later, whatever it is. So the idea was you would kill, you would checkpoint, then you restore by starting a new VNC viewer and you're, you're golden. Okay, very similar trick is the Condor trick, also from the early days of computing from the 1990s. So there, the idea was we want to be able to migrate processes. Why migrate? because the thing about Condor, the thing that was special, is they said that we're going to use all those unused computers. And if somebody used the computer, no problem, we'll migrate your application to a new host. So the application is on host one. Somebody wants to use host one, we migrate the application to host two. So good. So initially the application and it's perhaps is using some file descriptors, talking to a local file system on this computer. Now somebody wants to use host one. So we move the application to host two, 
using their own early version of checkpointing, uh, which if I remember right, I think it did not support multi-threaded applications. But for single-threaded, it was good. You move the application to host two. Uh, meanwhile, you have it talk with a stub process back on host one. The stub process hopefully is using very little time. So the person who wants this computer can use it. And the stub process talks to the local file system. So now the application can run using this local file system, move the application anywhere at all, maybe somewhere out of reach from the local file system, and you can still make it work. So again, the idea is disconnect and reconnect. And here's VMGL. VMGL uh, had uh, something, uh, ooh, I think I should have written solution one, the VMGL trick. In solution one, again, we see this. Uh, the VMGL trick, we have a stub over here on the host. Uh, so this was an early uh, version of supporting OpenGL, uh, not specifically for checkpointing, but it was within easy reach. Uh, what they want to do is to be able to have OpenGL running within a virtual machine and still reaching out to the graphics driver outside of the virtual machine. And they could play various tricks related to checkpointing. Again, I apologize. They should have said solution one, the VMGL trick. Okay, so for solution one, here are some notable examples. VNC, we talked about. Mbappage, I talked about it earlier. Mbappage and OpenMPI, both, they would disconnect from InfiniBand, checkpoint, reconnect. Now let's move on to solution two. For solution two, the idea is if something is difficult to checkpoint, then what we're going to do instead is isolate it as a separate proxy process, or maybe a separate address space or whatever. This idea also has uh, a certain history as uh, Shakespeare said, there's nothing new under the sun. Hopefully that was Shakespeare, somebody said it. Um, and so if we go back to uh, 1999, we see early attempts at uh, process hijacking. Uh, I won't talk about that. Ah, uh, yeah, getting slightly confused, sorry. I was right the first time in the slides when I said that this is solution two, it is. Here we're going to use a proxy process and an, a clear boundary. So in process hijacking, process a clear boundary. OpenGL, VMGL, clear boundary. Here the idea is again a proxy process. So the theme with a lot of these is a proxy process. Um, so uh, often it was called a stub process, stub process, proxy process, helper process. They all meaning, mean about the same thing. Finally, some years later, remember in our group, we were very nervous about CUDA and uh, NVIDIA. There had been early work supporting that by the group, uh, including Takazawa, but that stopped working with NVIDIA version four because they could no longer support the latest features of NVIDIA. And there's a longer story. So at this point, we want to support the modern NVIDIA, including recent features. Again, the solution was proxy processes. And we got a nice uh, publication out of it. Unfortunately, there was about 6% overhead. That was a problem. So at the same former student, Garg, Rohan Garg, went on to MANA for MPI. Here, we had hopefully started to rethink this idea of proxies and decided that proxies maybe was not the right way. So let me remind you, with TCP IP, the idea was disconnect. In our work, we then used in InfiniBand. Um, it's a longer story. But as essentially, we're moving over to the idea of proxy processes. By here, we were clearly looking at proxy processes. With MPI, um, the, we were initially thinking exactly about proxy processes. And that's when we called back Rebecca Hartman Baker here at NERSC and said, you know, we think we know how to support your grade GNI now. 
if we can set up a proxy process that is using the network, then we'll set the right boundary and we're golden. And uh, they ag agreed and we started th that collaboration. And then partway through it, we decided that we're getting nervous that overhead of transferring buffers between the, the ordinary process and the proxy process might kill us. So already with CUDA, we saw that 6% overhead. We did not want 6% overhead with MPI. Of course, we depend on the application. Some applications would have run just fine if they don't make very many MPI calls. Others that make very frequent MPI calls would start to suffer. So we switched to this new idea that I'm about to describe. Uh, this is where we want to, well, I'll describe it in the next slides rather than try to describe it now without the proper slide. But ultimately with that idea, it was successful. And then we decided to do that same thing for CUDA. And now we are in an active collaboration with Memverge to apply that same technique for OpenGL. So MPI, CUDA, OpenGL, one year separated in time for each. Hopefully we maybe think we know the right way now to checkpoint hardware. Well, so let's divide solution two into solution 2A. Those are the early results and solution 2B, this new idea we have. We're calling the split processes and you'll see shortly why we call it split processes. So it, here's the way, here's a slide from our talk on what we did for MANA for MPI. So the idea is we we're going to have two programs, an upper half program and a lower half program, but they were going to be inside the same address space. So normally the kernel will load a program into the address space. So we needed to write another piece of code that would do exactly what the kernel would have done, but this code will be in the in user space and load another program. And so now we'll just load this program first, some trivial program that is linked with the MPI library. So it has the full MPI resources. It has the, it's linked with the network libraries, libc, it has everything. And this helper application will do what we want. This helper application when needed can call on the kernel loader to load the MPI application into a separate address space. And that's why in solution two, I had added this last piece in the title and user space kernel loaders. Okay, and so now the idea, well, I'll, I'll say it briefly. We don't have time for to talk about this at length, but you're welcome to look at the uh, paper or else uh, some talks that were given on this idea, uh, which are still available. So, here, the idea is you start, you load the two applications, the MPI application, whenever it wants to make an MPI call, it makes a call to the MPI library. The MPI library will publish the addresses of all the APIs for the MPI calls. The MPI application will have a very thin wrapper. The MPI application makes a call, perhaps to MPI send. MPI send looks up the address of MPI send and then makes a call into the MPI library and we're good. And we get rid of the worst inefficiency with proxies. With proxies, MPI send refers to a buffer. We would have then had to copy the buffer from the MPI application to a helper process. But now we just pass the pointer directly in the in a way that looks almost like the native technique. The pointer in the MPI library points back to the other address space no problem. So while I refer to these as two separate address spaces, they in fact form one uniform address space. Each memory region is tagged as either upper half address or lower half address. And the programs are almost self-contained within their various address spaces, meaning addresses tagged as lower half or addresses tagged as upper half. Uh, then there was a similar idea then for crack. So this goes into a little more detail. I don't think we have time to discuss it here and it would be maybe a little out of scope. But again, you can look at the slide on your own or uh, if you like, you can uh, go back to the original paper and the talk, which I think there's a video. So 
coming back to the punchline. So what we do is we need to load two programs into a single address space. And I'll repeat, this is a single address space. Therefore, it's a single process. And maybe it has just one thread also. There's no need to have two threads either. It is a traditional single process with a single thread. It could have been done way back in the 1980s. Uh, no problem, even with Linux of that day, if you want, or certainly Unix. Uh, there was no need for having separate, uh, having separate threads, separate cores, whatever. So the idea by now should be clear. We launch the lower half program. It's gonna be a stub or helper process. This is our code. In our code, we have encoded everything we need. We've encoded something that knows how to uh, publish, publish the addresses of everything in the MPI library at a well-known address. We'll also include code that can restore a checkpoint image file into the upper half address space. And we've encoded a kernel loader, again, our code into this program. So this lower half program is our program. Our program has the kernel loader. Our program has code to publish the addresses of the MPI library. And our program has code to restore a checkpoint image into upper half address space. And now we're good. And then when we're ready, what the trick is, when we're ready, only the upper half is going to be checkpointed. The upper half will be running with transparent checkpointing, our DMTCP. Our DMTCP will be told, just checkpoint this portion of memory. Don't checkpoint the lower half memory, only the upper half. Everything else it does as normal, it'll checkpoint open files, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but only open files of the upper half application. OK, then we can restart the application on restart launch the lower half program. Now that, we've now that we have launched that lower half program, we wrote it. So we get to call our own restart routine. Our restart routine will then load the checkpoint image file and it'll load into the restore as a restored upper half into our single address space, which has two halves and we're good. There's a small detail. I don't have time really to talk about it, but with other CPUs that are not Intel, we don't have this problem. With Intel, there is a tiny overhead on the order maybe of 1% overhead, maybe less, it's hard to measure. But when we wish to switch from the upper half to a lower half, and if we are using thread local uh, variables, and we will because libc uses thread local variables, then Intel then Linux uses the FS register in order to support those thread local registers. And uh, under Linux, in user space, you can access the FS register. Under Linux, currently, if you want to set the FS register, you can. You don't need privilege. But to set it, you have to make a call to, uh, uh, to the kernel. And when you make that call to the kernel, that gives you some overhead of maybe a few microseconds. And that few microseconds might be large if you're making calls across this boundary often. But let's uh, round up this talk. OK, so this is about boundaries and plumbing. We uh, here are basically in bold the ideas behind our thinking. Newer and different hardware in supercomputing is inevitable and boundaries are good. Boundaries are what allow us to do the checkpointing. Boundaries have always been good. Uh, in our particular case though, now we have a harder problem in solution two. In solution two, we need to set boundaries within a single address space of a single process. So we need to say, what is upper half memory? What is lower half memory? So we need to enforce those boundaries a little more but that gets us past the next thing that we've noticed. While boundaries are good, boundaries are also bad. They are both good and they are bad. Why are they bad? Well, we've talked about that. They are bad in particular, if you're using, for example, proxies, you need to copy large buffers. Copying large buffers is really bad and would be uh, 
probably a showstopper in supercomputing. So the cure for larger boundaries then is better plumbing. And the better plumbing is you publish the address of your MPI library at the bottom or whatever it is that you wish to essentially virtualize or simulate in the lower half. That could have been publish the addresses of OpenGL, publish the addresses of CUDA in the lower half, but it's the same game. And once you've done it once, the second time is faster because you can reuse a lot of your code since it is the same game. And so we want to eventually just have a standardized template and then you fill in the particulars for, well, what is the hardware this time? Is it the network hardware? Is it the uh, MPI perhaps with even with kernel drivers? Is it OpenGL? Is it um, GPUs? Uh, maybe for open, is it maybe uh, something newer, FPGA, whatever. So here's some quick thoughts. I don't really have time to discuss it, but here's where places where maybe we as a community can also take our ideas even beyond this community because we do have more expertise in checkpointing than those other communities. So we, it's, this is something that's needed in big data. Fuzzing for cybersecurity could be very interest, interesting, save intermediate states, allowing you to fuzz deeper and you don't have to reach the intermediate states by starting from the beginning each time. Model checking, again, there's a tree of states to explore, save the intermediate states, deep debugging, uh, if you're deep in MPI, uh, for example, in MPI, we can see race conditions deep in the execution, and then maybe it crashes. And if that's deep in the execution, what are you going to do? Put in print statements? If this happened four hours into the execution, you're going to get a lot of print statements. And how do you know those are the right ones? We'll run again for another four hours, and another four hours, and another four hours. Are you going to explain to the funding agency why you constantly need four hours every day and yet you're not actually doing more production? All you're doing is debugging. So there's something interesting going on there. And then of course, higher quality software, checkpointing periodically. Uh, whenever you have a crash, right now, a typical system will say, we'd like to send a bug report to the developers. Wouldn't it be great to say, and we'd like to send the last checkpoint to the developers? So the overall moral is checkpointing is now a first-class object. So let's use it as a first-class object. Thank you very much. Any questions? And now, if you don't mind, I'm going to look to see how I stop. So, which I should have looked up ahead of time. So stop recording.